Well, hello and welcome along to the Andrew Eborn Show, where I'm delighted that my special guest today has been published in no less than six continents, 30 different language. She is the rock chick writer extraordinaire. Delighted to welcome <laughs> Leslie Ann Jones. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing incredibly well. It's so good to see you're glowing wherever you are at the moment. <laughs> Well, it's pretty warm today, isn't it? So, um, yeah, glowing is the watchword right now. Yeah, it's, it's rather fun. And what's also good is that life is starting to get back to normal. You were in an event in Holland Park a few days ago. How was that? It was really lovely, actually. It was the first time I think lots of us had got back out there. And it was an open air event, the Holland Park Opera Company, which has this glorious venue in the park, which is tented. So it's a bit of old building, a bit of old crumbly kind of stuff at the back. Then there's a stage and a tented thing. So I, uh, I think everybody felt safe gathering outside. And it was a really nice reunion and a good reaction to, um, to all those of us who were hogging the stage, uh, telling rock and roll war stories. Uh, and, and boy, have there been a few rock and roll war stories. I mean, talk about success. I mean, you have been oozing success for, for years now. I mean, you, you started off, and actually it was your father, I think, who uh, was one of the sort of biggest influences in, in your early life, wasn't it? You were born in Kent. Uh, tell me about those early days. Okay, so um, my dad was a professional footballer when I was born and injured out of the game very young because he snapped his Achilles tendon. And in those days, that was it. So he had two kids by then and had to find another profession. And he got into journalism literally by hanging around in Fleet Street pubs, drinking and making his face known. And eventually got a few shifts on a couple of newspapers and worked his way up to become the voice of sport. So he was a very impressive journalist by the time I was aware of such things as professions and a great inspiration to me. I didn't understand most of what he was writing about. Uh, football and boxing and that kind of thing but I it, it sort of sowed the seed and then I met David Bowie when I was very young he was a local hero I was at school in Bromley and he was living up the road in Beckenham my friends and I took to getting the 227 bus after school from the market square and going down to Beckenham walking up South End Road and knocking on his door to get signed photos my mother is horrified by that story these days I tell it sometimes to torment her but uh yeah she had no idea what we were doing in those interim hours after school I think we probably said we were playing netball or something um but I remember saying to my friend Natasha one day Angie David's wife she's going to be out she won't answer the door he will answer the door and he will invite us in for tea and that's what happened and I remember sitting there in this gloriously Christmas colored room with a silver ceiling and lots of bottle green and red velvet going on. And he's painting his nails with a, a, a cocktail stick with black polish and sitting there in this glamorous lemon silk kimono. It was so different from my home life. And I thought I have to grow up and be with people like this, yeah, but is. how? Oh, well, it is glorious, as you say, and, and that sort of stuff. I mean, as you say, there's a, a lot of, uh, apart from the fact um, that your father was, uh, Ken, uh, started uh, life, if you like, as a footballer, there's a lot of football and, and sport in the family because your uncle uh, was also very famous and your grandfather was also very famous in, in the football world before you made that transition. Tell me about some of your early memories of that. Were you taken along to some of the football matches? Did you cheer them on? I was too little, really, for that. Um... So, so the history of the family has been passed down by default. These were people I knew as old men already. Right. But when I was old enough to understand, it, it was very impressive to me that uh, my family were the Jones boys. You know, Wales is a country known primarily for rugby, but these were genuine footballing stars. There were five brothers of my granddad's generation and three of their sons, all of whom worked in the mines in South Wales and all of whom became professional footballers for first division English clubs and that is pretty impressive in one family. People used to rave about the Charltons, uh, you know Bobby and Jack Charlton who were great friends of my father's as being England's premier, well Britain's premier football family but actually I think mine outstripped them. We, our family twice produced the world's most expensive player the first one was my great uncle Bryn, my granddad's brother, who was sold from Wolverhampton Wanderers to Arsenal for the world record transfer fee in 1939. 
which was fourteen and a half thousand pounds. Imagine 14 that. Fourteen and a half thousand pounds. That's like a lunch account, isn't it nowadays? Oh, exactly. Uh, in the days when nowadays they earn a hundred grand a week, you know, yeah. the, the kind of minimal players. But there was a protest at um, at the Wolves ground at Molyneux. They the fans burned down the goalposts in protest at the sale of this amazing footballer. But then, of course, the war intervened, and so the best years of his club career were lost um and then there was my uncle cliff uh cliff jones who um the welsh, famous, wizard. The welsh, the welsh wizard, wizard famously played for spurs and he also uh made the world record transfer fee his sale was thirty five thousand pounds double the money this was illustrious <laughs> times <laughs> Absolutely. Glorious. So growing up in that family, as you say, that those sort of days, it puts it into context when you suddenly make that transition, if you like, and start going, <laughs> of all places, uh, knocking on David Bowie's uh, uh, door, seeing him painting his uh, his nails. How did the football crowd react to that? How did the football crowd react? Well, I, I don't think they, they were aware of it, really. I was just a kid at school, you know, going about my merry business. I was already... Um, hooked on music from such a young age. And I decided it was in David Bowie's front room that I decided I had to grow up and be among people like him. I wasn't artistic, I wasn't musical, I couldn't play anything. It's very curious to me that all my three children play a couple of instruments each and they can sing and they are, one of them is actually making his way in the music profession. Where does that come from? Didn't come from their father nor from me. So, that, so there must have been something going on, some sort of influence. Perhaps it was all the music I played them in the womb before they were born. But, um, but they seem to have acquired the, the talents and the skills that I didn't get. So, yeah, but I was on my way by then. The pennies dropped. I realized that I could go on the road with bands and write about them. So I knew at a really young age what I was going to do. And, and it is when I talk about the sort of football fans and how they reacted, the football crowd was more about your parents and that sort of generation and your father, the great sports writer. Uh, was he happy that you were mixing with a music crowd? Yeah, because by the time I started mixing with the music crowd, I was old enough, really. Um, I read modern languages at college. So I, I hadn't made up my mind. I was, I don't know where this came from, probably from a, a careers advisor at school. I was going to do French and Spanish and I was going to go and work for the United Nations in New York. I had this fascination for New York. Uh, I think many of us did in those days. It seemed like such a glamorous, the, the sort of ultimate destination, didn't it? And so that was the overall plan. But I got waylaid. Um, I went and did some work experience at Capital Radio in London. And the guy I worked for there, Roger Scott, who was um, the DJ's DJ, fabulous presenter, no longer with us, tragically, but he, um, he was very helpful to me, introduced me all, to all kinds of people, one of whom was John Pash, who was the art director at Chrysler's Records, who famously designed the most um, recognizable logo in the world, which is the Rolling Stones lapping tongue and lips. Absolutely classic stuff and yeah. merchandise that spun out as a result of that. So, oh, yeah. And poor old John got like 85 quid or something and tried to sue them years later. And I think he got a measly few grand. But then, good old John, he found the original drawings of the, those designs that, that Mick Jagger. Uh, commissioned him to to create and he ended up selling those to the vna for enough money to put his son through private school so hey, you know, he kind of got his own back in the end uh, in, in the good old days how, how much yeah. did he sell it for i don't know I, I don't think anyone ever put a figure on it but but it was enough money so he got his own back eventually but so anyway john was looking for an assistant i went for an interview i got that job and while i was there I was only at Chrysler's a couple of years, really. It was mid 80s. It was very exciting. Spandau Ballet, Debbie Harry and Blondie, Huey Lewis and the News, all those kind of bands. And yeah, Propel, mid year, all those. Thrilling things. times, party, party, party. It wasn't like going to work. You'd sort of dress up in the morning knowing that you were going out somewhere that night. And every night was a gig, every night was an after party. And we were young and we had the energy. And from there, I, Channel 4 was launching as the fourth channel in the UK, and I was invited to audition as a presenter of a new rock show. 
and I got that gig. So I had my sort of Warholian 15 minutes of fame in television. But what, what, what I love as well, Sally Ann, though, is all these sort of wonderful... Leslie Ann, even. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Leslie Ann, Sally Ann. Who called you Sally Ann? Look, wonderful I... Sally. <laughs> Leslie Ann. Oh, oh, Sally. What, I'm only what, small as well. I love it. I love it. What, what I love, Leslie Ann, as well, is that these wonderful puns that they come up with. So, so the series was called Earsay, wasn't it? Yeah, it was terrible now, isn't it? But during the 80s, that was kind of a thing, wasn't it? Come up with a pun and that's TV shows. That's a, a title. But yeah, it was a good experience. And we had some fantastic artists on the show. Uh, but it, I mean, I wasn't really cut out to be a television face. I had a, a face for Fleet Street, really. And I was soon invited to come and write a column on the Sun newspaper by Kelvin McKenzie. And from there, I was poached by the Daily Mail to move down the street and become their rock and pop correspondent in the days when every newspaper had a rock and pop correspondent. So that was my my sort of niche then. And I did that for several more years. Well, you were in um, street for 20 years in, I mean, what was... Rock overall, rock? yes, as a freelance as well, as a staffer and a freelancer, yeah. But it was quite, quite a difficult time there, wasn't it? It was quite misogynistic in those sort of days and trying to fight your way. You had to be twice as good as the men to get recognised, didn't you? There was a glass ceiling in place and it was a very sexist environment. I talked to young journalists today about the fact that you couldn't cross the newsroom without having your bra strap pinged or your bottom pinched. And um, that a story would come up that you had to go and interview somebody in Wormwood Scrubs and the editor would say, oh, we can't send LA as they called me because you know we can't send her into a prison. She won't come out alive. And actually a journalist is a journalist. It shouldn't have anything to do with your gender or the fact that you might wear a dress instead of trousers. And of course, in those days, we had to wear dresses and skirts. We had to go to work looking as though we could go to a wedding or a funeral at a minute's notice. So we were very smart. The men wore suits and ties. The girls wore dresses and skirts and pearls and all this. And also you had to have your passport in your back pocket or in your bag at all times. It was a sackable offense not to have it because there was no internet. And if a story arose on the other side of the world, you had to be ready there and then to get on a plane and go and cover it. So very different times from the journalism of today, but really exciting, really thrilling. And what were your, I mean, it was absolutely thrilling, but but also quite challenging. I know a, a number of sort of female journalists from that particular era, and they say, look, you, you had to go out and you, you went to the pumps and you do lots of your copy there, and it was incredibly sexist. How would you say, what were your best tips for surviving that time? Surviving that time, gosh, it's such a long time ago. Um, I think you just had to hold your own and not be one of the boys. That wasn't the way to handle it. The boys actually had to be one of us. And I think meeting people in the middle and rising above, rising above our gender, our girliness, if you like, and not getting too involved in, uh, in there was a lot of resentment especially among editors. Editors didn't like the fact that they were no longer on the road because to be on the road was the whole point of being a journalist. And I, I went in with stars in my eyes thinking, oh, this is about being a writer. I'm a proper writer now. But of course, being a journalist is not about being a writer. It's just about finding stuff out and about killing the competition and getting the headline and, and making sure the photographer's in the right place at the right time and so on. And it, we were pretty intrepid in those days. If you were in the office, you weren't doing the job. You had to be out there, always looking for something. And of course, those were the days when newspapers made things up. If it was a slow news day, sit around in conference and they'd go, well, we, we haven't got a lead. What could we come up with? Oh, I know. Um, Princess Margaret's having an affair with Elton John. Uh, So-and-so, get on the phone to Dickie at the palace and get a quote from him. LA, get down to Windsor and terrorise the old poofter and see what you can find out. And it was all very much that. And you would write the next day, uh, Princess Margaret or Buckingham Palace denied last night that uh, the, the Queen's youngest sister is involved with the rock star Elton John. You could get away with that stuff in those days. Nowadays, there are rules against it. Well, you it, can't. It, it is. It is bizarre. I mean, you, you mentioned about those sort of days, and and it is extraordinary. Never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. It was certainly that sort of thing. And they they refused to deny, or they weren't available for comment. All of those sort of things. Uh, but it is extraordinary. I mean, ten years on 
from the Leveson inquiry and the report that happened there. Um, we still have extraordinary situations where Matt Hancock and well, well that uh, um, uh, obviously hit the headlines, an extraordinary story there. The very fact that you can get a video of what goes on in a cabinet minister's office uh, um, on landing on the desk of the sun means that certain practices are still going on, aren't they? There's been a massive breach of security there. Somebody has clearly been paid to get hold of that footage. And we still don't know the answer to that. In this day and age, we should now know, we should have known within 48 hours really what happened there. So somebody's sitting on that. Somebody doesn't want us, the public, to know what happened. But was Hancock careless? Yeah, of course he was. And he was also disrespectful to his wife and family. Oh, I, 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 there's so many scandals, so many layers to that. Story yeah. Because people justify it, say, oh, hang about. So that's public interest and so on and so forth. And you're absolutely right. It's scandalous. And you have the hypocrisy and whether it's a social buzzle, bubble or a Westminster bubble uh, is, is, is separate. The disrespect to the family is extraordinary. But you have to, as a journalist, question everything. Because if you drill down into the story, actually that recording happened several weeks beforehand. So the leak, I think it was happening in, uh, it was about six weeks beforehand. The leak didn't happen until that particular time. And why did it happen then? And you sort of say, well, they wanted to mm. highlight the conspiracy and what's going on. And Dominic Cummings is coming out on telling all these stories behind the scenes. It's a journalist dream, but it does beg that question about security. You know, it begs the question about privacy. And it was it's about the 10th anniversary of Leveson, uh, as you know, just a few weeks ago. And you turn around and think, well, how has it changed? Well, it and hasn't, it has it? You know, and, and, and also the public is always interested yeah. in the private lives of public figures. So that's never going to go away. The subterfuge, the underhand behavior, the sale of uh, private property, which is what's really happened here. The uh, film footage of um, CCTV within the Palace of Westminster should not be up for grabs. It shouldn't be for sale. And yet it would appear that somebody has profited financially out of footage of a minister, a government minister doing something behind closed doors. So I guess the story will come out or will they hope that we'll have lost interest in it by then? There ought to be an inquiry, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. There are more important things such as thousands of people dying. Yeah, um, yeah will we ever know the truth? Well, I sometimes wonder whether that, we ever know the truth about but, anything. I, I think what happens as well, Leslie Ann, is, is, see, I got the name right. I, I, I do know your name. I've known you for years. <laughs> You've been friends for ages on Facebook. It is true. I wonder if we're friends anymore. Oh, no, yes. I'm joking. <laughs> I think I was referring to, to a different long leg, Sally. Anyway, it's a different... No, I'm joking. I know, it's always a thrill. Um, no, but it, it is interesting because they have, I mean, that's the whole thing about these inquiries. And, and Leveson, it was the, uh, they've had so many, what, seven reports they had within 70 years, is how he said. And, and you talk about, well, has the press changed? Because they spent 5.4 million on the inquiry. We had, what, 360 people giving evidence, all the great and good of Fleet Street and, and, and celebrities and so on and so forth, saying how terrible it is. But putting it in perspective, you as a journalist have a pressure to make sure there is a headline news all the time, isn't there? There was that pressure in Fleet Street at the time to find the sensational. And if you couldn't find a story, you made it up. Well, I didn't make anything up, but things were made up. You know, I wasn't actually ever party to those things directly, but I witnessed them. Um, it's like people being wired for sound and going into situations where they're recording people without their knowledge. It's against the law. It was then and it is now. I never did it. I was never required to, but I was a music writer. So I wasn't really involved in heavy news. Very occasionally I might be somewhere at a particular time when something would happen and I'd be required to bring the news spin to that. And I did have my share of front page stories and splash headlines and that kind of thing. But usually by accident, because I happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, shall we say. Yeah, well, what was your favorite headline story? It must be very proud when you get your front page. Ah, it's, I mean, it's, mm, it's um, a mixed blessing, really. I remember being one of the first to uncover the fact that Boy George was a heroin addict. And I did go around to his house and I did knock on the door and he did ask me in and we did talk about it. And I got that on the front page of the Daily Mail. Looking back, was that a good thing to do? Did we do him any favours by, by doing that, by exposing it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He ended up uh, being convicted. 
and um, he did receive the help that he needed at the time. But you're in a different mindset, and those were the 80s, yeah. and things we hope are very different now. There does seem to be some modicum of better press control today than there was back then, but there were awful lots of shenanigans going on in those days, and it seems that there still are. No, no, there certainly are. I know several editors who who have the safe of stories which they will release at the appropriate time, and I think that that's the honest answer still, isn't it? Yeah, and I, we know stuff. You know, I, we still talk about it when I get together with journalist friends from the old days. We have our lunches. One thing I do know about journalists is that it's not exactly honour among thieves because journalists are not bad people, but but that camaraderie never goes away, and it's almost like an addiction. So you do stay friends with those people for life. And every now and again, you'll meet up at a funeral or a memorial service or you'll get together for lunch or dinner. And it's just like falling back in with your best friends all over again. Yeah. And there's a shorthand, there's a language among those people, which people on the outside literally don't understand. Yeah. But yeah, there are stories. There are stories that we still know about that have never come out. And we'll sit there going, oh, wonder how long it'll be before that comes out. You know, it'll, it will eventually. There are which things that... Story, which story are you hoping will break next? Well, I'm not going to tell you because, you know, I might incriminate myself. But um, I will <laughs> be able to say to the kids. To... Well, yeah, I'll be the one saying to the kids, oh, wow, we knew about that 30 years well, ago. I mean, but you will be. And that's the thing. There are these stories. And, and you and me both, we, we, we mix with certain people who will tell you, well, one day this story is going to come out and people are mm -hmm. going to... So Jason, and it does the whole media landscape, if you like, and the predictability of how the media cover events. I mean, it's what, what we talk about with elections and so on and so forth. You mm. know there's going to be a scandal just before voting day. You know there's going to be a bit of distraction, as there was in the movie Wag the Dog, so you can get that sort of good news breaking, so, so on and so forth. If people get wise to that, then they might be able to make more informed decisions. Well, they might. Uh, I've said for a few years now that I think newspapers are doomed in the same way as there are no national newspapers to speak of in the, in the United States now. I don't know whether USA is, is still a force to be reckoned with, but it hadn't been for some time. But you have local newspapers there. You know, you have the LA Times, you have the New York Times, you have they're, they're, they're sort of localized organs, if you like. Our national newspapers are diminishing. The circulations are through the floor compared to how they were in the 80s. Um, the Independent is online only, for example. Um, how long before print newspapers disappear altogether? And I see that coming because they're not a primary source of news anymore. We used to get our news when it dropped through the letterbox of a morning, but now we have it 24 seven on the internet, on the radio, on television. And so the newspapers are following the news now. They're, they're backing it up. They're not breaking the news. And that's the major difference. Yeah, well, the, the people now go to the newspapers for analysis, don't they? And I think that's the idea. You're right, news breaks, and it's that hunger for news. It's not the, the, the rush to see who's the most truthful, it's the rush to see who is first. And it's um, like they always say that uh, if you don't read the newspaper, you're ill-informed, and if you read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Well, that's so true, yeah, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's opinion. So therefore, they're not newspapers anymore, they're magazines. They're, they're journals, they're reviews, but they're not newspapers. Yeah, I, I, it's got to be right, hasn't it? And, and mm. I, I always advise our children, everybody, look, get your news from several different stories, because, sources, because if you're working on the premise that this person is telling the story coming from a particular angle, a lot of people surround themselves trying to confirm their own opinions and their own prejudices. So you read a certain newspaper, you watch a certain channel, you surround yourself on social media mm. with friends who might share the same view, all you're doing is confirming your prejudices. So true. There is a Westminster scandal of such magnitude at the moment, which quite a lot of people are talking about. Nothing has appeared in the press and it probably won't come out because it is so scandalous, involving two government ministers. And was I shocked when I first heard it? No, because it, it's just a sort of logical conclusion, really. Does anything shock us anymore? You know, is there a, an imaginable story that would actually cause us to go shock horror? You know, the world has ended. I've just heard this. I don't think there is. We, we're a bit jaded to 
shock horror and scandal aren't we now but and, and when that's right. i think so when channel 4 launched and, and you were there in the, in, in the great days of that sort of stuff it was pioneering because you'd have one f word and the whole world would go into a meltdown nowadays every other word it sort of punctuates every other sentence doesn't it it is a shame i think because we used to have the watershed after which people could say the odd swear word and people wouldn't bat an eyelid. But now that you can get everything on iPlayer and catch up and nobody's watching anything particularly after nine o'clock at night, you might watch it at 10 o'clock the next morning. Your mother might happen to be visiting and she's then exposed to all of that post-watershed so-called material that, that shouldn't really be for her eyes. You know, we try and protect our elderly parents the same way as we protect our young children. And so, so they become the same generation in a way because we're looking after both sets and we become the sandwich generation who's sort of horrified on everybody's account. It's, it's a very odd place to be. It, it is an odd place to be and, and it is sort of seeing that, that sort of side. But you're right about camaraderie and, and your father was, was a very popular writer. I, I loved what uh, Norman Giller said, said about him uh, in, um, in, in some kind words. He said, look, I won't uh, come to your funeral unless you come to mine, I think he, he famously said as well, didn't he? They had a, a good joke together. Norman did come to my father's funeral, which is nearly two years ago now. It was it was an astonishing day, actually. Um, I believe from memory that it was George Cohen's 80th birthday. George Cohen, famously of the 66 winning World Cup squad. And uh, George was there in a sort of wheelchair. It hadn't been very well. And I'd gone outside because, you know, the family file out first after the service and heard this singing, sort of post-service singing and went back in and Norman Giller was conducting the remaining congregation in a rendition of Happy Birthday to George Cohen in front of my father's coffin, which I thought was surreal. It, it, it is the 22nd of October, 2019, you're, 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 that, that, that was the date. And it was, um, it's, I, I can get your name wrong, but I can get the dates right. <laughs> it's good. He knows more than I do. I go, there you see, there you go. Um, but, it, but it is extraordinary, but it's that camaraderie, it's rather like a different mindset. You've got information, and it's really weird, isn't it? Because you've got information, you share experiences, some of which you can talk about, and you, you've done those in your, in your brilliant books, Tumbling Dice and so on and so forth, and we come on yeah. to that. We'll come on to your books, I promise. But you, you work on that sort of premise. There is that strange sort of understanding, which is a binding force in the society, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, but I sometimes wonder how much falsehood we're feeding people. And really a return to the truth would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Having said that, there have always been three versions of the truth which is his, hers, and the truth. So the truth depends on who's telling it. And uh, we need to be mindful of that, I think, always. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And it is opinion. And, and well, as you know, my background as a lawyer, we say, we'll tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Sounds like multiple choice now, doesn't it? Which version do you want? Which to version do you want? But actually what you get, especially in a a court of law is uh, very often far removed from the truth, indeed. Absolutely. Well, it's one person's opinion. It's evidence. And, and that's the difference. It's one person's perspective on the story. And that's how you can get to the bottom of it. Are there any inaccuracies in anything that's, uh, that you know about which should be corrected? In my books? Yeah. I hope not. Um, the thing is, when you uh, interview people, you can verify facts to a certain extent. But if we're talking somebody's memory of an event, somebody else may well have another memory of that event, having seen it from a different perspective. It's like standing in different corners of a room, watching something unfurl. So if you're standing over there by the door, you're going to have a different aspect of, of what's happening in the middle of the room than the person in the opposite corner, for example. So hmm, it's important to show as many sides as you can. And it's important to verify things. If somebody tells me something about a location, for example, wherever I can, I'll go there right. just to see for myself. And I suppose that's the journalistic training, reverberating. It's always, for me, about seeing for myself. Oh, absolutely. And, and as you say, as we famously hear in that, that, that phrase, which is going to rebound in 2021, recollections may vary. Yes. Uh, yeah, because... He also, memories aren't uh, 100% accurate all the time, are they? Sometimes somebody will say something to me and, and I'll say, do you know, I have no memory of that whatsoever. My mother sometimes comes out with things. 
And I think, is she is she trying to mess with my head or what? Did that really happen? And is she winding me up? Or, um, or, or has she remembered it was me wrongly and it was actually somebody else? But I like to think that my memory is pretty good. Um, you know, I, I work on it being good. So when somebody tells me something that I was there when I can't remember having been there, I do sometimes wonder, have they misremembered it or have I? Yeah, no, it is. So when you approach these interviews and you've interviewed some fantastic people, when you approach these, tell me about the process beforehand, because uh, as a lawyer, what, what I try to do is as much research. I mean, I'm the world's expert on whoever you're going to be talking to, <laughs> especially with their name. And you work, you work on that sort of premise. And the key then is you probably know the answers to most questions that you're leading people down. How do you approach your interviews? Everyone's different. Every single one is different. It depends on the personality. So like you, I would do as much research as possible, read as much, make as many notes. I tend not to have a prescriptive list of questions because yeah. I think interviews are all about listening to the answers. What and each answer, what was that? Each, <laughs> each answer will take you onto another question yeah. that you might ask. So, so really, you know, when you do television interviews, not this one, of course, Andrew, but sometimes when I've done television interviews and the presenter asking the questions hasn't necessarily been the person to do the research. A researcher will do that work and then they will present the presenter with uh, a couple of pages of background material and a list of questions to ask. And you know, just by looking at them, that that presenter isn't listening to you. They're looking at the next question to ask and feeling out how they're going to phrase that and so on. And you just know when you come out of your answer that they haven't heard a word you've said. But, but do, so I, do, I'm, I'm quite mischievous. I mean, we both swapped roles on a, on a, on a few occasions. With yeah, people. sure. I, I could be quite mischievous sometimes and throw something in where they give a sort of, oh yes, really, and, and that sort of stuff. So you could, do you ever play with the interviews? Um, so I have done, but we used to do quite a lot of that on Fleet Street. So when, when, when the sub editing was very tight and certain words would be impossible to get into print, so a bunch of us would meet over the wine press on a Friday and it would be a fiver in the hat each. And we'd choose a word, we'd decide on a word that we had to try to get into print the following week. And whoever managed it would get the proceeds and then would buy the next round and then we'd go again. And we did manage to get some quite obscure words You're past the subs. No, I'm not going to tell you, I'll not for any money. Give us a couple. Not for any money. <laughs> it's a family show. Hey, hey, I don't know what I don't remember. I think we changed all that years ago. But yes, <laughs> but it was, it's that sort of thing, isn't it? Where you want to introduce a word or or you want to introduce song titles or or you have, it's what I'm saying, is that little camaraderie that comes up because you need to have fun. At the same time, it was a pressure cooker of uh, sort of uh, time, if you like, for journalists. And that's why I say you had to do, well, how many stories did you have to do? It's quite different for some six, eight stories uh, for some journalists. It was quite tough. <laughs> Yeah, there wasn't really a, a number on it. We had to work on stories every day. And so working for a paper like the Daily Mail, who are famous for over commissioning massively. So they'll, and also they would do this thing called creative tension in the office, but where they would set two or three journalists on the same story. So you'd be up against people who were actually your friends outside of the office. and Or they would sit you next to somebody and then set you in competition. It was all a bit Rottweiler-ish at times. I think Fleet Street, or we still say Fleet Street, don't we? But the newspaper industry might have grown up a bit since then. Yeah, well, I, I felt really quite sad. I mean, I, I, I used to be based in the temple. I had a, a free flat in the, in the temple. There's a baby barrister. Wow. Which was a joy. So, and I used to go to the Wigan Pen Club, which is now closed down, but just before it closed, it were, was a Vietnamese restaurant, which, which I felt quite sad about. Mm. All those lovely pubs, they're all closed right now, of course, because people aren't really back in the office and they don't have outside space. They don't have gardens, those Fleet Street pubs. So they're not open right now. But one of the great pleasures of Fleet Street back then was doing the pub crawl, wasn't it? From place to place to place, because all the newspapers had their particular office pub and you weren't supposed to go into the Daily Express's pub or the Poppin' Jay was theirs. And we had the Harrow at the Daily Mail, which was down off uh, by opposite Northcliffe House, where, where the paper was based. And each of the papers had their own watering hole. 
and uh, that, that I was there very recently, and and also the old Bank of England, um, that that's done, and uh, and the old cock that that those are open. I went there just last week. They're all. Oh, open. you did. Okay, and the, but the wine press is gone. The wine press was where everybody congregated. It was sort of communal free for all, but that's long gone. I think it's a Robert Dias or something now. It's a shame. Those days are gone. Those days are gone. Yeah, no, it, it's extraordinary stuff. You also um, obviously went on tour with uh, some great bands at the time. Talk to me about some of those. Just really, uh, we were required to go out and cover the first nights. And some of those covering the first nights extended into going a bit further on the road. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, capers really. Um, there was very much a feeling of what happened on the road stayed on the road. A lot of what you witnessed, you didn't write because you were there at the behest of some publicist, some PR who worked for the band and their job was to keep stories out of the papers really. So you would never be invited back on the road if you exposed some of the things that were going on among members of the band, among the fans, just general sort of misbehavior and um, shenanigans. If you wrote all of that in a newspaper, that would be your very last invitation to go out with that band anywhere. So you had to be discreet and keep quite a lot of it back and write a review of the show. Uh, it's only years later now that I'm not beholden to any editor or any newspaper that I can really write the whole truth, going back to that again. It is interesting, those sort of pressures, because you are there, as you say, and, and there was that sort of, what people are beginning to understand, there's that sort of trade-off. You said, look, we'll give you this story if you bury this one. Damage limitation, as it's famously known today. But back then, you didn't have, to the degree that you have today, the plethora of publicists and agents and managers and hangers-on. You didn't have so many people in the middle. So you could, and I did very frequent, frequently even, um, have face-to-face one-on-one time with whoever the artist was. And I would have my exclusive interview. Nowadays they have junkets. So they go sit 12 of them around a round table. They all put their microphones in the middle of the table. Everybody hears everybody's questions and everybody gets everybody's answers. And that's a bit of a cop-out. It's not the same as having an exclusive interview. But it's the way it works for those publicists now. And I think the main reason for it is that individual newspapers do not have fantastic circulations anymore. So they do a mass job and, and they add them all up together thinking, well, you know, if we take these 12 journalists, then we'll uh, add up to, to a couple of million readership. And I can see the point of it, but but it's all about publicists these days. With but all the shots. It's all, it's all about publicists and managing the brand of the band. Isn't yeah, it? I hate that phrase. Don't you hate that phrase? No, 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 but that's what it is. That's what they're. They're people. not a brand. They're people. They're. Uh... You're you're right. But what happens? That's what publicists are there for. They're there to manage a brand, and and you're mm. right. It commoditizes the whole thing. And what what I love about what what you do and and did in those days, you developed a relationship with the people, and it was a, a mutual relationship, a relationship of trust, where you're not going to necessarily expose everything but you will give stories they're happy to be told. That was the times, you know, you could do that. And, and I've had plenty of young journalists say to me over the years, we became journalists because of people like you, because of the great lifestyle you were having. You were crashing around the world on Concorde in first class, staying five star, turning left on every plane, uh, going on their yachts, waking up on their yachts when you hadn't meant to, down at Cannes and things like that. It was a caper. But it was also hard work because you had to get results. You couldn't just go from party to party. You had to produce the stories as well. And sometimes it was awkward. You might have been partying at a rock star's place the night before. The next day, some story might arise, some new story, and you'd have to go down to their place and knock on the door and you'd have your news reporter hat on. And that could be compromising at times. They didn't want to see you wearing both those hats. They wanted to know that you were in there in a circle or you were outside of it. And it is difficult because it is that sort of compromise, isn't it? Because you've got that trust and a lot of the people that, that you write about, it's fair to say they're probably friends, aren't they? Yeah, uh, they have been. Um, I'm less out there than I was because we're not getting any younger, are we, Andrew? And uh, I'm not such a you a wild at all. I can. Oh yeah, well, I'm not. I'm not the wild party animal I was once. Let's say, 
um, I, and my energy levels don't uh, don't last as long as they once did. But but the same thing goes for them. You know, you will find a lot of rock stars who were real hell raisers back in the day, who nowadays don't drink. They eat salad. They go to bed by nine o'clock, and uh, if they're not in bed with a with a book by nine thirty, they go home. And is that a rock and roll story you're allowed to tell, or do you have to tell stories of people throwing TVs out of hotel rooms? I, those cliches, I mean, I'm, I think people like Keith Moon did that kind of stuff back in the day, driving Rolls Royces into swimming pools and those sort of things. I never saw anything that extreme. I really didn't. No, it is interesting because you do have to, and I know again, go back to the whole brand thing where you have to be the bad boys of rock and, and you would have bands being pitted against each other because nothing draws a crowd like a fight. Yeah, that's true as well. But I think a lot of it was exaggerated. And, uh, you know, with each new telling, the story gets more colourful, doesn't it? Yeah, um, and did you ever lose any friends as a result of stories that you broke? Once or twice. Personal friends, yeah. Uh, usually through misunderstandings, I would say. Sometimes a journalist will deliver their copy to their editor and then it goes for sobbing. And the truth leaks out of a story as it goes through each mechanical stage before it hits the actual page of the newspaper and the interview that you do with a person can wind up bearing very little relation to what actually happened and was said so yeah there were times yeah. and who, who have you lost as a result um moving swiftly on <laughs> Now's the time, Leslie Ann, to set the record straight. Because so often, what I love about this medium is that it is direct and so on and so forth. There's no editing. You can say to people, look, this was misunderstood. If people understand how Fleet Street as it then was, works, is that sometimes somebody will write the headline who's got nothing to do with the story. Because that's the thing that grabs people in there. And that could be the misleading interpretation. It's not your fault, it was somebody else. I often get asked about things like copy approval. And copy approval, for anyone who isn't aware, is when somebody agrees to give an interview to a newspaper and they get to look over a draft of what's going to appear in the paper before it actually publishes. And if there's anything particular that rubs them up the wrong way, if they don't feel that was an accurate representation of what they said, or they wish they hadn't said it and want to take it back, they have an opportunity to uh, tweak it, let's say. What they'll never get is headline approval or photo approval. So the newspaper has the last laugh because their subs can then set a headline which throws a different light on the piece and they can choose photographs which suggest other than the copy is leading the reader to believe. So ultimately the newspaper is always in charge and the subject will never have the last laugh. And that is a risk you take. So you have to weigh up if you're doing deals with newspapers. You get this a lot, for example, with authors who are required to promote their book by their publisher. So the publicist at the publishing house or an independent publicist will come on board and they will work with the author and say, right, well, we're going to do this or this or, or this newspaper has bought your serialization, which means they have paid for the right to run extracts from your book over a couple of days or a week in their paper. And you think, oh, well, that's okay because they're just presenting chunks of the book. But no, because in lots of cases, they will um, abbreviate. They will, it's, it, it's, a, it's a shorthand version of what the author actually wrote. So that too can be misleading. And then the aforementioned headline problem and the picture problem. And then you might end up with something that doesn't actually sell the book very well at all. So these battles are going on all the time. The big money days have gone. There was a time when an author could land a deal with a newspaper that might run to 100, 150,000 pounds. Nowadays, the deals are very small. They, they, in lots of cases, don't even pay for them because it's free publicity. If you think of a newspaper in which you might uh, pay 100,000 pounds, an advertiser for a full page color ad, or you know, 20,000 pounds for a quarter page or so on. If you're running over three pages, three full pages in a newspaper, that can be viewed as free advertising. So therefore the newspaper has the right to treat that as they wish. And it doesn't always suit the author. 
I think most people on the outside don't know any of this. And they just assume that, for example, if, you, if you've written a book and somebody else has um, abbreviated it, cut that down, made it suitable for serialization, it'll still have your name on that piece. So people assume that you've written that piece, but you haven't done that. A journalist has done that version of your book. So it can all be very misleading. Well, misleading and also frustrating, I would imagine. Terribly so, yes. Um, yeah. But people do still say, I'm not sure I agree with it, that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Oh, of course there's bad publicity. I mean, we, we, all, we all know that's absolute nonsense, don't we? We also know that there is smoke without fire. Oh, yes, I, absolutely. We would create the smoke. If it, it is that glorious illusion. But it, it's what we talk about fees and, and fees in the media are are extraordinary at the moment, because I always say, look, a fee is a fair exchange of energy. And you're right. It could be publicity. Television presenters don't get what people imagine they get. But they would say that that's their shop window for going back to that horrible phrase, the brand. And also, if you're selling a product, as I am when I'm an author and I have a book out, people assume that every time they see you on television or hear you on the radio, that you're raking it in and that you're making fortunes out of this. But of course we don't get paid for those television appearances or those um, little, little radio slots. Our documentaries we are paid for. And I always advise colleagues of mine when they, they might ask my advice about whether they should do a documentary. Well, how much have they offered you? Oh, well, they, they didn't, they said there was no fee. Well, hang on, everybody on that production is getting paid from the producer, the director, to the cameraman, to the sound guy, to the lady who brings in the sandwiches at lunchtime. They're all getting paid. So the provider of the content, i.e. me or you or whoever it is brought in to contribute to that documentary, without content, which we are providing, they can't make that documentary. So... My view is that every contributor ought to be paid. The French are terrible at this. They are the absolute worst. They, oh, in our country, you know, we don't pay people who appear on television. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine then. <laughs> Next. Um, no, it's a professional contribution, isn't it? Oh, and, and that ought to be remunerated. Absolutely. And, and you've done some great documentaries yourself. I mean, Ken Russell, Thank you. Nix and so on and so forth. Um, talk to me about some of those. How do you, is, is there a different approach when you're doing a documentary to when you're writing about somebody? Because obviously it's on the screen, it's more immediate and so on and so forth. You might uh, uh, follow them for a period of time. Talk to me about your approach to documentaries. I've never produced a documentary, but I've contributed to many and appeared in quite a lot. And of course, the, it's, it's, it's the reverse process, really. I always say that television documentaries take, in some cases, months to put together. And then the end result is the tip of the iceberg. Most of it is left on the cutting room floor, that old hackneyed phrase. And lots of people who contribute to these things never actually appear in the end product. So uh, it's a reverse process. And it takes much longer, so it's much more indulgent, I think. Uh, newspapers are much more immediate. Um, in general, if you're working on a daily newspaper, the story you're writing, working on today, will be for tomorrow's paper. So it's a much more speedy process, and the pressure is, is on. Documentaries are more relaxed and... Um, yeah, more self-indulgent. Well, also more self-indulgent, but also going back to that thing about the truth, isn't it? Because, I mean, if, if you've got time, so it's not the rush to be first, it's the rush to be accurate and get those interesting stories. Yeah, I've got a musician friend who's quite often called upon to fix things at the last minute. And um, exactly. his response to whenever they, they lean on him too heavily is, well, well, do you want it good or do you want it tomorrow? You know, so he needs a bit more time, in other words. Who's that? Uh, Ah, well, that would be telling. Ah, no, get more, more gigs for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway. <laughs> Always fun. Um, but you also get other members of the family involved as well from a very early age. Talk to me about the Pampers ad that you got your daughter involved with. Oh, gosh. Um, again, I was a, a journalist on the Daily Mail and um, took a call one day from somebody at J. Walter Thompson, the advertising agency. And the question was, which brand of nappies do you use? So I said, well, Pampers. My, my daughter was about 18 months old, I suppose, at the time, and uh, my first daughter. And they said, oh, good, uh, because we're looking for a genuine journalist 
to do an endorsement uh, advertising campaign, uh, but you have to genuinely use our product before we could cast you. So would you be interested? Uh, there's no fee because it's endorsement advertising, but we would be able to offer you payment in kind, which turned out to be uh, a year's supply of nappies. So that was quite good. You know, I didn't have to buy nappies anymore. That is a big expense when you're when your children are little, as everybody knows. So it so we ended up doing this. Um, yeah, I think it was about a three day shoot. And of course, there's a lot of pretense involved. Uh, it's not your house. But the suggestion is that the house that you're filming in, that's your kitchen, that's your kitchen table, that's your typewriter, the little girl is bashing away on, on the end of the table and so on. So, so again, you're misleading the viewer, aren't you, really? So the endorsement aspect of that ad campaign is only true to a point. Uh, I was dressed up in the kind of clothes I would never normally wear. My hair was done in a plait down my back, something I would never normally do. And they stick a ton of makeup on you and they give you a script. So how true is it? It's all an illusion, isn't it? Well, the advertisements are an illusion. And again, those, those are the interesting days when people pretended to be doctors. You now have to start the phrase, well, I'm not a doctor, but... Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all acting. Everything is acting at the end of the day. And of course, we do, we do present different versions of ourselves in a variety of given situations. So not everybody is getting the genuine you or me in an interview scenario. People hold things back or they project things that aren't necessarily true reflections of themselves. So we're all playing the guessing game, aren't we? So what guessing game are you playing today? Ah, well, just uh, wondering where I'd seen that jacket before. <laughs> hey, is that right? I know we're always there. No, I've not seen you wear that one before, actually. It's, it's looking very chic. Oh, well, you. Thank you. And I was trying to work out, because, come on, famous rock and roll writer extraordinaire, what do you wear when we do these extraordinary things? You talk about that sort of stuff. But I thought, get your black shirt and your pinstripe suit. It's a, it's a hint at something, isn't it? A black shirt is always the failsafe. I'm, I'm known as the woman in black. I very rarely wear anything other than black. And it's, um, it's kind of a uniform, really. I don't want to have to think about... Uh, what I'm wearing that day, I like to blend into the background. So, so black works for me. So you well, chose well there. Yeah, well, I, I had Krista Berg on the show. So we've done the lady in red. We can do the yeah. woman in black. I think that, that. The woman in black, yeah. There's a play, isn't there? The woman there is in black. There's a play. There's also the woman in white. I think we've done every single thing. We should do the rainbow yeah. colours in between, shouldn't we? White is a really good colour for rock stars in the stadium. Uh, Diana Mosley told me this. She designed famously Freddie's Freddie Mercury's uh, costumes for the 86 tour and other tours besides the, his wonderful crown and his ermine trimmed cloak and all of that she did. And the yellow little jacket with the white trousers. She said that white is a really good color, especially for stadium gigs, because the people at the back in the gods can see you moving around on stage. I know, it's, so, it's brilliant. The, the other great color is red as well. For, for mm -hmm. the yeah, I never wear red. Red's not for me at all. Really? Why not? It matches I don't know. It's, it doesn't do anything for me. It's, um, I've never worn red. It's uh, interesting. I'm so glad I didn't have a red school uniform because I would have been uh, very compromised by that. What colour was your school uniform? My infant school uniform was bottle green. And my secondary school uniform was navy blue. There you go, there you go. I had, I went to a school called Probendal and our, our blazers were bright red. We had to wear these bright red caps and uh, and we wore shorts, even though I was incredibly tall, even at that age. Um, so it always looked a bit a bit bizarre. We certainly stood out. Are you having therapy for that? Well, I, I, I'm probably permanent. This <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I tell you, I was a little bit scared to be honest, because I used to. It was a, a little private school called Prebendal, and we used to travel home on the bus. And uh, you used to get the high school kids in their bottle green, their bottle green blazers, who were a bit rougher and tougher than us. Mm. When my son was at his um, secondary school, we I, we used to give them a sort of wind cheater type thing and tell them to take their blazers off, fold them up, and put them in their rucksacks and wear the wind cheaters before they got onto the coaches, so they wouldn't get beaten up by the boys from the other schools. Um, or if they were going on the tube or anything, always put your blazer away. So you're just full of great life hacks. You know, I mean, come on. 
it was worth checking in, wasn't it? Absolutely. You mentioned Freddie and that iconic sort of outfit with, with the, the white and the yellow, which certainly stood out. You were at the side of the stage of Live Aid in 1985, another big anniversary uh, has just happened, obviously, with, with, with that sort of side. Uh, tell me how that came about. I was very friendly with John Entwistle, the bass player in The Who, also sadly no longer with us. God rest his wonderful soul. And his girlfriend at the time was a girl called Max, Maxine. And I used to stay with them quite a lot down in Still on the Wold. He, John had a wonderful house called Quarwood down there. And they also had a house in Roehampton. And that was where we all stayed the night before Live Aid. And then we went to Wembley the next day in John's converted Rolls Royce. He had a, a Rolls Royce converted into a station wagon. Can you believe? sacrilege isn't it because he had a huge dog the dog was an Irish wolfhound I swear was about seven feet tall on its hind legs called fits perfectly and he fitted perfectly into the station wagon back of this Rolls Royce but because there were so many of us going to lot to to live aid that day being the smallest I had to get in the back with the dog and uh, I remember we got to Wembley to the car park and Kenny Jones, the drummer with The Who at that stage, had just arrived. And some of the driver, Cy, walked around the back to open the boot um, so that Fitz and I could climb down. And Kenny Jones ran up and started singing Who Let the Dogs Out, which I thought was very unkind, considering I'd had such an uncomfortable journey all the way from Roehampton. Who, who let the dogs out? Come on. It yeah, I know. Healthy. I know. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting day that because I remember Bernard Doherty, the publicist, was in charge of the, the passes and there were press from all over the world. And he, I think he only had a handful of what they call triple A's, um, the AAA uh, passes, which is access all areas. Yeah. So he would give them to a couple of journalists. And he'd say, get in there. Uh, You've got 20 minutes, get what you can, get back out, give me back the pass. And then he'd pass the passes on to the next journalist down the line so that everybody was getting a bit. And I remember going into the backstage area and it was it was very much like a sort of um, the pioneers moving across country from New York towards the West Coast. The sort of wagon train effect with all the wagons parked pointing inwards and each of these bands in their trailer and there was a branch of the uh, hard rock cafe where people could get burgers and chips and little lunch and stuff and Elton John wasn't having any of that because he didn't want burgers and chips so he was cooking a little barbecue in a stinky corner sort of down on his haunches and there was David Bailey set up a little makeshift photographic studio in one corner and everybody was nipping in there and smiling for the camera and doing all that and it, it was great camaraderie everybody sort of left their egos at home um but i remember queen in particular they were coming on like a divorcing couple at the same party they weren't really talking to each other very much there was something going down there was an atmosphere and freddie was with his boyfriend jim and not only was this Jim's very first Queen gig that he'd ever attended, it was his first gig ever. He'd never been to a gig before. And of course, the audience was the whole world, which was the greatest stage imaginable for Freddie, wasn't it? And they rose to the occasion. They were the best band on the day. And it's putting that into, into context, isn't it? Because Queen were, as you say, and, and it was depicted in Bohemian Rhapsody as well, they were having a difficult time at that stage. As you say, mm. he was with his, his new boyfriend at that stage, never been to a, a, a Queen concert, let alone no, no concert at all. And going to see that adoration, Freddie was in a difficult place himself. Uh, obviously, his health was not, not great at that sort of Well, time. that isn't true. Uh, the, the film certainly gave that impression. But Freddie's diagnosis didn't come for another two years. So that is one of my beefs with the film. I do have a list. And that is one of them. Because, list because I, that's what I wanted to talk to you about as well. Because mm. going back to your point about journalism and so on and so forth, because they depict him. And you knew Freddie during this stage, and, and absolutely. So the depiction of him, they sort of merge stories and they change history and rewrite it and accelerate certain other bits and so on and so forth. The brilliant bit at the end where it's virtually the same stage as it was 
at the event and you can see that the sort of crowd that worked really, really well. What were the other bits which were inaccurate? I mean, there are lists and lists. You can find them on the Internet. You know, people who sort of watch the film a hundred times and, and make a note of every single inaccuracy. Brian May has said it's impossible to depict a 45 year lifespan, which was Freddie's, in two hours or however long the film is. So you have to concertina things. You have to shorten things and uh, leave things out, leave people out. What you don't have to do is make things up and change things. And you don't have to invent people who didn't exist. And there is a character, quite a big character, Ray Foster in the film, who is their record company executive, who says they can't release Bohemian Rhapsody as a single. Do you remember the scene? And course, they, go, out, they go outside and they start chucking things at the window and all that. Classic role for Mike Myers as well. But, but, but Ray Foster didn't exist. Yeah. He was a composite character. And there were enough record company Rottweilers they could have selected one from you know they didn't have to make somebody up maybe that was for legal reasons but the real people are out there or were out there and must be thinking well actually why didn't they just tell the truth but, 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 and that happened with a number of these biopics I mean Ray Williams is a is a good chum uh, as you know and talking about the Elton John Rocket Man story and and the depiction of him and what happened there he said well hang about there. again there's all sorts of elements which are not quite true yeah I know Ray very well and we've talked about it at length but the thing about Rocket Man which is also a, a brilliant film is that I felt it was much more of a sort of La La Land type film much more of a fantasy approach and people breaking out into song as you would in a musical on stage and there was a lot of the realm of the film was inside Elton's head and he was either imagining things or dreaming things and so on and so you could almost blur the edges quite seamlessly and it wasn't offensive. With Bohemian Rhapsody I felt very strongly that the film is presented to fans of the music as a true depiction of what happened and quite a lot of it isn't true. So I took issue with that and there are also some really important people missing from the film who should have been there because they were very important people to Freddie. So people like uh, Peter Freestone, who was his right hand man for the final years of Freddie's life. And he was very instrumental in everything Freddie did and was Freddie's best friend. He's not there. Neither is Barbara Valentin, who was uh, an Australian, sorry, an Austrian actress, very famous actress. Yeah, uh, German speaking films. And she and Freddie bought a flat together in Munich and they were very close. And they had a very fulfilling and meaningful relationship, which was quite complicated because it involved other people. And Barbara very much deserved a place in that film. Mary Austin was presented, but she was presented as, you know, this is a, this is a film of, of the tragedy of uh, a gay man who's in love with a woman. And that, wasn't the case. It, it wasn't as simple as that. Freddie was a very complicated man on very many levels. And if Mary Austin deserved a place in the film, then so did Barbara Valentin. We should have shown all sides of that, I think. So they oversimplified it for me. And facts and figures changed. Uh, albums came out at the wrong time. Tours were, they were sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it just didn't need to be like that because fans, you, you take an awful lot of abuse from fans. I do. I get terribly trolled on Twitter and, and to some extent on Facebook and so on just for telling the truth. And they'll say, well, Brian May and Roger Taylor are the co-producers of this film. They wouldn't allow anything into the film that isn't true. Therefore, we believe them. We don't believe you. And these young fans were not born at the time that Freddie died. So they don't really have any memory of Queen in real time or how things happened and no inclination to, to go back and read about it because that, it's not what that generation does, is it really? It's human nature to rather than just listen to somebody who does know. And this is why mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the illness side and about Freddie and how he's depicted as being ill because you're right, he wasn't. It wasn't that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Very different. They did have a fractious relationship. The, it was strained and that bit was right. And you, you saw that sort of side. And part of the reasons it might have been because of the relationship with Jim. But it does also show that when you try to shine a, the spotlight of truth, on a particular matter. The fans don't want to listen to that, do they? No, they don't. Um, they have a sanitized version of what happened. And of course, 
there was another quite cynical aspect to the way they sanitized Freddie's story, which was to put bombs on seats. They had to make it appeal to the um, whatever the PG guidance uh, specific um, certificate is, but they were appealing to the widest audience possible. So to make it a passable for 12 year olds and upwards to see it, they had to leave out certain aspects of the, the racier elements of Freddie's lifestyle, let's say. So that also uh, diluted the truth. Uh, there were things which maybe ought to have been there because it would have shed light on why Freddie became ill in the first place, that kind of thing. His years in Munich were barely touched upon. And yet Freddie spent significant time in Munich, as did the rest of the band. They recorded there for some years. And that was a very uh, important turning point in Freddie's private life as well. So for me, and I know uh, German journalists from Munich who were quite offended that their city wasn't represented and that that true aspect of the story wasn't told. Why do you think it wasn't told? Because it's too dark and it's too racy and it would have necessitated a higher viewing certificate. So they would have had a lesser audience. But, but uh, dark and racy sells though, doesn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't sell to that demographic, does it? Because it's not allowed to. Well, but, but I understand, but there are other demographics. We have Game of Thrones, you have all sorts of things. That, and, and other things are made. And we had Charles Spencer on the show um, and the whole thing about the crown, you know, about that sort of side. And that, that, that's the problem, isn't it, Leslie Ann, is when you're mixing what's supposed to be apparently a sort of documentary type program. We touched on documentaries, but you're also putting a bit of artistic license. And it's, oh, this, sure. and it's the damage. And he, he spoke very eloquently about one of his relatives who was actually defamed, if you like, damaged in a particular, portrayed in a way which is just so far from the truth, whose relatives are still alive to this day and don't recognise the person, actually feel very aggrieved about the portrayal in something like The Crown because of this artistic licence. Well, how much more offensive can it get than the way Her Majesty's been defamed in that series? And I know Andy Harris, the executive producer, known him for a long time, used to work together on ESA, funnily enough. He was a cameraman there. Um, it's a fairy it's story. It's, that's why we can mention it. It's exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a fairy story. Her Majesty isn't presented accurately. And I read, I think in the paper only today, must have been early this morning, that Sarah, Ferg Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, had offered herself to Andy Harris, as it were, Imagine as a consultant, uh, and she was turned down. Yeah. So if actual members of the royal family, even uh, distant members of the royal family, had, had asked to become involved and to uh, become accuracy consultants and were refused, were turned away, it begs quite a lot of questions, doesn't it? Oh, and and that, that's my point, is you turn around and say, look, hang on, are you making an entertainment thing or you're trying to portray it as a documentary? Well, what Charles Spencer said is that if it's a, an artistic license, that's all fine, but tell people at the beginning, put a warning at the beginning, this is not accurate, some events have been made up, because otherwise the damage that goes on is terrible. Tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. That's exactly true. And my children, all three of them, believe that the crown is an accurate portrayal of the royal family's history. And we know that it's not. There was another series on television, I think it ran to three series, called Victoria, starring Jenna Coleman from Doctor Who as Queen Victoria. And historically, that series was not accurate. But it was, a, well, they described it in the end as a version of the truth. So the suggestions were, you know, the backdrop was was all there, but the, of course, nobody was in the room. So dialogue we know is invented between say Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert. Nobody else was in that bedchamber at that time. So anyone with a brain knows that some writer has, Daisy Goodwin in this case, has sat there and invented the dialogue. So the warning signs should flag up already. Ah, well, this is an interpretation of what happened, but it can't ever be the truth 
because no one was in the room. And it is so, it is so important. That's why I sort of bang on about it. I mean, quote talking about Bohemian Rhapsody and then I sort of lead into to your own book where you knew Freddie, you knew the people, as you say, there are so many inaccuracies in it. It's, it's a great movie, but it's a movie with a slight... It's different. entertainment, yeah. It's entertainment. But make that clear to people because people will mm. regurgitate that and the fans will troll you because you're trying to tell the truth and say, look, I was there, I knew Freddie, this is what happens, read my book. Mm. Yeah, and then you get other kinds of abuse, such as, um, well, you're trying to say that uh, the film is a film of your book. No, I'm not. I've never said that. Yeah. I've never actually said that. Uh, where, where, where do you find that? Show me the place where you've read that, that I said that, because I never have. But it's that putting words into people's mouths, which is very damaging sometimes. And yes, everybody has a right to reply, except that Freddie doesn't. He's no longer here. And the royal so, family tend not to either. So they, they never do, never complain, never explain. Well, that used to be the case. It's slightly changed a little bit now. Her Majesty has never given an interview, ever. You think she ever? In her, no, she I don't. I don't. But before? whenever people ask me, who would you really like to write a book about that you've never managed to, to get to yet? I always say Her Majesty the Queen, because she is in her 90s. She's been on the throne for 70 plus years. She has seen it all. She's seen presidents come and go. She's seen members of her own family uh, die in tragic circumstances. She has a head full of memories and feelings and emotions that she has never shared with the public. And I think to know how she really felt about all the things that have happened in her reign would be the most fascinating book of all. I don't want to hear Prince Harry's version of that. I don't want to hear. And a big, a big, uh, as an author, a lot of, a lot of money being offered to, to him. Yeah, and there are two sides to that, really. You'd have to say, well, okay. So we said it about J.K. Rowling. We said it about E.L. James when the Fifty Shades of Grey series first published as books, as opposed to a fanzine online. The sales of books such as those make it possible for publishers to hire authors of a more modest caliber, let's say, whose sales are going to be a lot less. So it does give careers to writers who might otherwise not have one because it generates the funds. Is it, is it worthwhile literature? You know, there are, there are many opinions on that scale, aren't they? But I, I think in the case of Prince Harry, I can only see dark clouds ahead. I can only see damage coming. And I think it's tragic that he would wound his grandmother in this way by announcing these books to come, one of which they've even said it won't be published until after her death. And I sat there thinking, please God, let her live another 20 years. Yeah. Oh, because well, that, that'll wipe them all out. Yeah. She, she's an amazing lady. I mean, the other person is obviously the, the Duke of Edinburgh. Did you ever meet him? No, I never met him actually. And, and I've never met the Queen, but I would have loved to, but but it didn't happen. So, um, but I still think she would be the ideal subject. Oh, she, she's, well, they, I can tell you, and I, I had the joy of meeting them both on a, a number of occasions. Um, and uh, they are they were the perfect double act. And she, he would go in and warm up the room effectively. And I I remember, as you know, I'm a magician as well as a lawyer. And we were all lined up, and we had a dinner at, in, in the Middle Temple Hall. And uh, and this is Andrew Evil, and he's a barrister and also a magician. And uh, a magician sort of said, "How nice!" and and, and walked on. And and, and uh, Prince Philip sort of um, did a couple of same introduction. He took a couple of steps, then came back to me and said, "I bet that's good for pulling the birds." <laughs> <laughs> classic him classic him isn't it and the rabbits and everything else absolutely and yeah. he, but he didn't mean offense by he was trying to warm up the room in mm. a way that her majesty um basically she was just brilliant and they were the brilliant double act together i think it's a real shame some of what has been said lately and the way certain people seem hell-bent on destroying the monarchy uh it will dwindle and die off in its own time but I think the damage that's being done to it right now is really quite shameful. It, 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 it's quite true. And in, in your time, I and mean, you've had um, all sorts of interviews with all sorts of relationships. I mean, Michael Hutchins and uh, Diana, for example. Tell me about that. Well, uh, I, I, again, I wasn't in the room, but there was a suggestion that they did meet and have an affair. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Nothing like that surprises me. Uh, they met in Australia, didn't they? Um, I forget the year and the event, but I could tell you if I looked it up in my own book. 
but there was a suggestion that they did have a liaison and who would be surprised by that really she made no secret of the fact that she was quite her head was turned by rock stars she did like that dangerous slightly subversive dirty element and maybe that was an antidote to what she was involved in and married to like, that was always her thing was the rock and roll aspect prince charles always looked like a fish out of water at those prince's trust gigs and, and at wembley for live aid and they didn't stay very long i felt sure that she would have stood there all day and rocked out all night but they stayed a few numbers and then off they slipped it was a real shame yeah. But no, I wasn't. I wasn't at all surprised by by the idea of uh, Diana and and Michael Hutchins, and also the fact that he took up with Paulie Yates after that. And Paulie Yates was a bit of a cut price die, wasn't she? She she looked very similar to Diana, although she was very small compared to Diana, who was tall and willowy. There was that same sort of look, that faux innocence, that very blonde, wide eyed. Well, and, and that famous interview on, on on the bed when they first sort of met in the studio and all that sort of the flirtiness you, you can see chemistry was all there wasn't it know, of course it was and, and that sort of stuff which is not and the camera never lies well sometimes does but but you work on that sort of premise camera and, always lies <laughs> but it, but it's that sort of tragedy as well though because it wasn't long after diana's death that that, that michael himself uh, well took his life apparently it was terribly sad. And of course, we never really will know the true story of that because all, all the principles have, have passed. So, um, yeah, there was a suggestion at one time that their child together, who was uh, Heavenly Hirani Tiger Lily, I think she's known as Tiger. Whatever happened to Deirdre, absolutely. Well, yeah, exactly. But um, there was a suggestion that she was the next kind of rock star in waiting, that she had a great voice and great musicianship and that she was about to break through. But people were saying the same thing about three of Michael Jackson's children, uh, that they were going to be the, the sort of next princes and princesses of pop, but that's never really happened either. They said it about Sean Lennon, John and Yoko's son. Um, he is a musician, he's well into his forties now, but it's never really exploded for him. So it is quite rare for a rock star child to supersede the parent. But yes, yeah, it, it is. I mean, very difficult. Julian did very well. I I, I liked her. I liked teardrops and so on and so forth. And, that, and he had... did, but he walked away from it. And the reason he did was because uh, he he was sick and tired of being projected as the next John. He wanted to be a musician in his own right. He didn't want to be a shadow of his father. But the record industry had other ideas, and, and the record industry is, is is very cynical place, as you know. That's, that's what they tried to do. A lot of the children of sort of famous parents um, basically try to go the other way they change their name or they carve their own sort of career so there's a pattern I, I always I mean I always say that history repeats itself because we don't learn the lessons from history and if you look at so often that people who are children of famous people they have such emotional difficulties themselves trying to get recognized as individuals yeah it can happen I think um, those who are most successful choose other careers they don't try and uh, ride on the coattails of the parents but a lot of the time they're encouraged to do it by, by record companies who, who see an opportunity. And it doesn't generally work out. There are a few. I mean, Zach Starkey's had a really good career, Ringo's son as a drummer. So, so some do break through. Uh, Bob Dylan's son, didn't he? Had, um, had a fair career for, for a, a stretch of time, but it's, it's not the pattern, it's not the norm. It's the exception to the rule I, I've seen. No, absolutely. Well, I have a business with RJ Gibb, who's the son of Robin. Uh, mm -hmm. RJ is blessed with a fantastic voice, but it's the sort of legacy of, uh, of his, and that's the next big biopic, which is going to happen. And oh, is it? The Bee Gees. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but but talking about the legacy of uh, of his uncles and and also his father and the usual sort of thing that goes on, but also RJ's own sort of music. But it is it's always that you don't want to live in the shadow of, of your parents. Yeah, I think Stella McCartney has the right idea. Being a fashion designer, she's done very well. And Mary, her sister, who's a photographer, you know. Uh, but I think James, the younger brother, did try to become a musician. But I heard that he suffered crippling uh, shyness. And so never really was going to break out of Paul's shadow. 
And it is, it is difficult. I mean, Paul, you know Paul very well. I mean, you, you've obviously spoken to him for a number of years, but you also knew Linda very well. And going back to puns, and I'm always a sucker for a great pun. Uh, I, I, I love this. Mac, the, the, the wife, come on. That would have been brilliant. There isn't a better title, I don't think. Well, she was thrilled by that. that. I book just on that, you know, Leslie. I yeah. think brilliant. It's a real shame that book didn't go ahead because she had such a story to tell as a Beatle wife in a way that it had never been told before, not to settle scores and not to make money the way poor Cynthia Lennon had had to do because her divorce settlement was so meager. So she had to do something to, to keep the show on the road as it were. But, but Linda didn't need it for that, but she had a unique story to tell, not from uh, the point of view of an actual star, one of the artists, but, but also from the point of view of a wife who also had been put on stage and thrust into the limelight by her Beatle husband. And so not very many people had been in her position over time. So she could tell it from both ends. She could tell it from being behind a keyboard on the stage and she could tell it from the audience. She could tell it from the bedroom and from the kitchen and through the eyes of her children as well. I felt it was a really valuable story, and uh, I really I regret that that book never progressed. Yeah. Do Do you want to go into the reasons why it didn't progress? Not really, um, because I wouldn't want to upset anybody by saying what happened. But um, let's just say it was uh, it was frowned upon that she was trying to do something in her own right. So um, the project was shelved, and then tragically she died. So it could never be revisited. She was a lovely woman. I really liked her. She was terribly kind to me. I met her the very first time at Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. And uh, that we were there for the opening of a new wing for terminally sick children. And she was a patron of the hospital. So she arrived. The journalists, we were all behind a, a red kind of rope barrier. And I was very pregnant. It was the summer and I was due to give birth at the end of August. So I was there in the front row looking very sort of hot and bothered and quite large. And she walked in the doors and she spotted me. And instantly she must have realized that that was going to be a very difficult gig for me to, to walk around the ward of a, a wing for, for terminally sick children. And I'm about to give birth. So she took me by the hand and said, you're coming with me. And uh, she just held onto my arm and we walked around the ward together and and I joined her for the lunch afterwards. And uh, she said, keep in touch, let me know what you have. And then she took to inviting me to book launches for her vegetarian cookbooks and so on. And she would always send a little note with the invitation. How's lovely Mia, stay veggie, love Linda. She was very a charming, charming woman and uh, much missed by her family, I'm sure. And are you, are you veggie? I am most of the time, actually. She was the one who switched me on to it. Yeah. Occasionally you'll go to dinner at somebody's house and you know, they've made chicken or whatever. And, and sometimes you just for the sake of harmony, you eat what's put in front of you. Do you know what I mean? Only but, eat animals that eat vegetables. That's what I, that's my rule. So I think. Well, there's that as well. But um, I do occasionally eat fish, vegan, so I can't. My daughter's vegan. And I tell you Is what, she? Fantastic vegan recipes out there. And I think that's, they had a bad PR rap to start with, but all of us, mm. um, there's some fantastic stuff. And uh, there really are. I, one thing I do find with vegan recipes, because my daughter had a lunch back in April and two of her guests were vegan. So she said, we want to have vegan lasagna. Will you make it? Yes, sure, Give the recipe, everything else. It took about five hours to make this thing because every element of the dish is a separate preparation. Then you've got to assemble it all and everything else. And it was so time consuming and laborious. And I think they scoffed the lot in about 10 minutes. I know, it's it? so disappointing. I, 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 yeah. I, Apparently. At least they ate it. So. Oh, no, at least they yeah. ate it. But, but I think <laughs> I've had the best cauliflower cheese, the best mac and cheese I've ever had was the vegan version of it. And yeah. going on to puns, you'd have chili, chili non carne or whatever, you know? I, yes, I, yeah. That's sort of clever stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they're going through a good. And the other thing I love about them, they do their wonderful, they, now they come back again, they have a wonderful camaraderie at the festivals where they do they combine music and people selling their wares as well as the fantastic dishes so those sort of vegan festivals are superb i do believe in veganism um as as a, a way forward for humanity uh, vegan cheeses for example um no one needs to eat dairy anymore 
we don't have dairy in my house um, we use oat milk um, things like that I know there's a lot of criticism of things like people who eat avocados because of what it's doing to farmlands in far-flung places and so on but I'm sure there are ways of working that out um, we don't need to eat animals anymore not really do we well, I, I think that's the thing. It's looking at these alternatives. I and mean, a lot of things I'm involved with is exactly the same sort of stuff. So rather than just finding, complaining about the problem, about climate change and so on and so forth, there are solutions. And yeah, there are. are those solutions. It's, it's like, mm. I mean, one of the charities I'm involved with as well, it's called UK Harvest, which is basically a food excess um, charity. So it's educating people that half the world's population is, is, is starving, but there's enough food to feed the world. And the amount of, amount of stuff that we threw away is crazy. So we were behind one of the campaigns about wonky vegetables, you might remember a few years back. Yeah, I do. Yeah. The big CEO cook off. We work with Jamie Oliver on certain things where you're raising awareness. And that's what it is. You don't necessarily need to raise money, but raise awareness as to how we eat and what food we, we've been wasting and so on and so forth. And if you can do that, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah, I said we're, we're from the generation that didn't throw food away. Our mothers wouldn't allow us to. We had to finish up what was on our plates. And what did they say to you if you didn't finish on your plate? Well, my mother used to say, "You'll sit there till you eat it." Oh. <laughs> so, well, there's a, they, would, they would they would often scold us. I'm sure it happened in a lot of households. They would scold us. Saying, there's a child starving in Africa. Uh, and that, that's what they would say. And, and it's tragic at the time. But most of children at that time would be flippant about it and say, well, send it to them or something. He said, and, and you have to have that sort of understanding now where you shone a spotlight as Live Aid did and so on and so forth, that people start to think about waste and let's not be flippant about it. Mm -hmm. And say, you should finish what's on your plate. I, I went to boarding school where you had to. You turn yeah. around and you didn't eat that sort of stuff. Um, I remember you got, to, you got beaten in those days. Yeah. But it's, things have changed a lot, haven't they? I mean, in our young day we didn't have recycling for example that wasn't a thing all the rubbish went in the same bin or milk bottles were collected uh wash milk bottles we didn't generally have very much in plastic there wasn't cling film uh you put a saucer over something if you put it in the fridge if it was left over so quite a lot of the things that we've come to depend on never really needed to be invented in the first place we didn't need cling film did we we didn't need plastic containers to put food in uh, and I like to see that a lot of this plastic is being rethought because that is choking the planet. Absolutely. And it's horrible. And you see, you see what's happening with, with, you know, you need a campaign, you need to face for a campaign. But when the turtles get the straw stuck in their nose. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unthinkably horrible. Yes. And, and I think looking at that sort of side makes sense. But also the confusing language of food. You used to have a best before date and an eat by date and a sell by date. And what, what mm -hmm. does that mean? You know, get rid of that. Make it easy to understand. Because we never, things going off, we never used to have that in the, in the good old days, did we? No, we didn't. But uh, maybe people should have sell-by dates. Ah, maybe... I think that's, that's... that's a whole other argument. But well, ah, we won't go there. I, know, I love that idea. Best before, we should stab people. On the... Yeah. Change it. You could have little things going down. Well, they did. There was a movie about that, wasn't there? But you, you have to keep re reinventing yourself. And your life expires unless you get, uh, I don't know, you have to collect something. Oh, that was a... Um... Kazuo Ishiguro novel, I think. I can't remember what it was called, though. Yeah. And with um, well. Carrie, the actress called Carrie somebody with the amazing mouth. Can't remember. Um, my memory fails me today. Talking of, uh, talking of actors, it's a terrible segue. I don't even know I should do it. But talking of actors and wonderful, uh, wonderful mouths and things like that, um, talk to me about the airplane trip that you almost took, sat next door to uh, our friend, um, Mr. Grant. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I told you, I told you the terrible segment. I thought, well, I'm not do that. Uh, but uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Oh, uh, that was uh, back in the 90s. Back from LA during that time, set the scene. What happened? I was working for the News of the World. I had a column on the News of the World, my best job ever. Piers Morgan was the editor and he hired me. And it was the Leslie Ann Jones big interview. And it was a different celebrity every week. And it was, I was in Los Angeles doing a series of stories when Hugh Grant was arrested for indulging in um, carnal activity with a, um, a paid young lady called Divine Brown in his car on Sunset Boulevard. And uh, I was assigned to get an interview with him. I was working with a really good journalist, top journalist called Stuart White, uh, who was the West Coast correspondent on the News of the World. I worked on lots of stories with Stuart and uh, we, we'd already bought her up. 
Divine Brown and her family, and we whisked them off to um, a remote hotel in Palm Springs. And so she was well away from prying eyes and any other newspapers you might try and scoop us and spoil the story. So the next thing we had to do was get the interview with Hugh Grant when he was released by the police. So through his contacts at British Airways, Stuart discovered which flight Hugh was booked on to, to cruise back to uh, the UK. And he bought me the seat next to him. So he wasn't obviously going to be told that I would be his um, companion during the flight, but it was all done um, sort of underhand with the cooperation of British Airways staff, let's say, who were perhaps on the payroll. Am I allowed to say that? The news of the world is defunct now, so we can probably say that. Anyway, so I board the flight and uh, it's all looking very promising. Uh, I get on first. I'm in, say, seat 1A and he was going to be in seat 1B. So I'm tucked in by the window. My bag is in the overhead locker. And as usually happens with celebrities, they board the plane last. So, so the plane is full. Everybody's rocking and rolling and then they bring them on at the very last minute so that they won't be seen by anybody else so Hugh comes in he opens the overhead locker stashes his bag sits down next to me buckles up and then he takes one look at me notices me and obviously recognizes me and you've never seen anybody bolt off a plane as fast as he did that night so I'm stuck there on the flight I can't disembark and I then all the pennies drop at once. I don't get the story. You know, it's, it happens. Newspapers deploy people. They might have 20 of you working on the same story. Not everybody is going to get something, but that was quite a big something not to get because it was so near yet so far. He was in the seat next to me one second and the next second he was gone. He'd legged it. So but it they didn't. Move him, did they move him to a different newspaper? Seat? He got off. He got they off. Got he was off the plane. He legged it. And, uh, I believe he took a private jet back the next day. Have you spoken to him since? No, although my son, I don't know whether I can say this on here, but we went to a review of another friend at a little, one of those theater pubs in Battersea, the Latchmere it was. Oh yes, that's And that. it was, uh, so there we all are. My son was about 12 at the time and we were there for the show. During the interval, my son nipped into the gents to do what, one does in the gents and he's standing in the stall next to Hugh Grant who had come down to see the show and he said mommy I didn't know if I should say anything and I said probably best not in that situation Henry. <laughs> I put the stall right next to yours to get the excuse. Yeah so one minute it was the mother in the next seat and then it was the son in the next pea stall which was it was kind of uh, you know uh, history repeated itself and uh, came full circle, yeah. It is extraordinary, and, and they, there's a thing about, I mean, Hugh is a fantastic actor, but what it shows is that we are, and this is the thing about celebrities, that we are all the same underneath. If you prick me, do I not bleed? If you tickle me, do I not laugh? Yeah, it's true. I mean, his, look, he, he paid a prostitute for, um, you know, we know what went on in a car, and he was in a relationship with Elizabeth Hurley at the time, who always seemed to me that she was famous for having really done not very much at all. There, was, there wasn't a lot of acting going on there, was there? Um, I think it was more about the, the, the betrayal of his beautiful beloved, and that was why it was a scandal. Also, he was a very famous actor at the time. He was sort of our premier kind of uh, romantic comedy sort of face, wasn't he, at that point? And, he was a really big star. But I, I feel a little bit offended by all the disingenuity since then. He's been really angry with the press and very vociferous in the Leveson Inquiry and so on, as if he was done some great wrong. But the fact is, he did it. He was in the car with that prostitute. He did break the law. He did have sex in a public place. He was arrested for it and, and he did pay for it. And all we were doing was what we were employed to do, which was write about it because it was a news story. And that was the kind of thing we covered. So we actually didn't do anything wrong. But according to him, we were the villains and he was in the right and he was wronged. But, the, but that's the interesting thing, isn't it, Leslie? And this is what we touched on earlier. I mentioned the Leveson report and uh, the big anniversary, 10 year anniversary since that happened and things not really changing. To what extent do people have a right to privacy? Well, 
is it in the public interest? It certainly is if, uh, as in the case of Wayne Rooney, we're seeing this now, he, he's claiming that he's been set up and that it was a sting, but there is footage of him walking down the road with these 21 year old glamorous blondes to their hotel where they were already um, checked in as guests. Now, presumably nobody drugged him. Presumably he wasn't on a lead. I couldn't see one in the picture. So he's gone of his own volition to that hotel with these young ladies who are not his wife, Colleen. So there is a misdemeanor going on there. He's, he's the manager coach of um, a very well-respected football club, Derby County. So to what extent can we trust him and respect him to do his job properly when we see that this is how he plays away from home? I think it is in the public interest when a public figure is involved in misdemeanors because it's about trust and honesty. I know in France, they turn a blind eye to that kind of thing. And if the president's having an affair or if the prime minister is, well, how does that have any bearing on his public office? Of course it does because it boils down to trust and to honesty. And if those two things are not being upheld and maintained, then chances are they might be inclined to get involved in misdemeanors in their public office. So they're bringing the office into disrepute. And to a lesser extent, uh, an actor, a celebrity, an entertainer is doing the same thing. If he is thumbing his nose at his relationship with his official partner, hmm, what does that really say about him as a man? So it would make him diminished in our eyes, I think. And does he have a right to our adoration if his image that he portrays is actually not really who he is. Well, which is interesting. I didn't say the, uh, the over, actually over 600 people, so the, the 337 in oral testimony and a lot sort of uh, wrote down uh, another 300 written down reports. A lot of them were from celebrities and others in the public eye who complained about their invasion of privacy. In what circumstances then do you think it's not acceptable, not acceptable to invade somebody's privacy? It's a really hard question to answer and not ever having been that kind of journalist, I'm probably not qualified to answer it either. Um, everyone is entitled to a private life to a point. I think that tapping people's phones, uh, following their children, uh, having um, making attempts to compromise other members of their family who are innocent of anything at all. And such as in the case of, of Meghan Markle's father, I think it was appalling the way he was compromised because he is a simple guy with a private life whose daughter happens to be shot into the spotlight because she's become engaged and is getting married to a prince of the realm in another country. It's unfair to expose him to the kind of invasion of privacy that she was subjected to, which is not to say that I'm on her side in things that have gone on since. But, but I think, yes, certainly in the case of, um, of non-celebrities, people who are not making their living by selling themselves to the general public, um, which Meghan Markle was certainly doing by being an actress in the, the series Suits, it's unfair to pursue members of her family because they are private people. So, but I think if you if you set yourself up as a public figure and you make your living as a result of being well known because of having a product out there which is consumed by the general public, I think most aspects of your life are fair game. I'm, which bits aren't fair game then? Well, your children, other members of your family, as I've just said. Um, your, your financial affairs, I think, should probably remain private. And I think there are laws against exposing that kind of thing anyway. But, but wouldn't you say every other aspect would be fair game? Well, well it's interesting. I mean, they say the whole concept about right to privacy and, and why mm. they obsessed with him. When people sign up to do a job, they're signing up and they'd like to be a celebrity. Are they really? This is what people would argue. So Max Mosley, for example, who uh, another who's no longer with us, uh, was it right to talk about what he liked to do behind closed doors? Well, I think it was right to expose him for what he was doing because it portrayed a side of him that was sinister and offensive to many people. And 
the public had the right to know the truth about him. He did win his case against the news of the world, I believe. Um, and the judge ruled that he had a right to privacy. But I've often thought in the case of judges, and I do have a couple of high court judges who are very good friends of mine, and we debate this endlessly. Sometimes the high court judge has more to hide than the celebrity who brings the case. So of course he's going to come down on the side of the celebrity. Well, but you can't invent a law. You know, there is either a law of privacy or there's not. And this is why uh, we, we have, we talk about freedom of speech and it's always the balance. With great freedoms come great responsibilities. And it's all about defamation. And to what extent, certain countries do it differently, but to what extent should there be any right to privacy? What you're saying effectively is you're in the public eye. There's nothing which is off bounds other than your family, if you like. Ah, but I'm not in the public eye. I'm a mere humble scribe. Just an author. Oh, you're, and, you're, you're far from, well, you're, you're, you're certainly humble, but, but certainly, I mean, come on, six continents, you're missing one, though, that Leslie and say so six continents, 30 languages, you're far from humble, you're phenomenally successful. Your life hmm. is the public eye. I don't think there are any publishers in Antarctica, though, are there? So, um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm safe there. Um, so I'd be a bit, yeah. Well, I'd be a bit shocked if, uh, if journalists turned up on my doorstep and started doorstepping me for stories. But um, I'm sure if I were involved in some scandalous misdemeanor that I would have to expect to be exposed. The same as anybody would, really. Um, you talk about, I mean, I mean, you touched on this earlier. There are certain things that you have seen and heard which you will take to your grave. So um, talk to me about some of those and, and why would it- No, because I'm going to take them to my grave. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk to you about them. Yeah, I said nothing. But not are... for any money, she says at this point in the game. Yeah, no. Um, no, there are things that I will not talk about. And, and I'm sure you have those things as well. Every, everybody does. And this is my point. So if somebody's in the public eye, why is it right that a journalist can dig into all of those things uh, when you and I and other people, everybody out there, will have things they don't want uh, aired in public? Yeah, I agree. And I think every case is individual and separate, which is why you have these people bringing super injunctions. We know who they are because those things attract a lot of publicity. There is the Internet and things will quite often be exposed on the Internet and make a mockery of the super injunction because that only protects them to a certain extent, but they can be exposed in a hundred other countries. So everybody knows what's going on anyway. Um, the, the Internet has opened all our knicker drawers, hasn't it really? Um, there aren't secrets anymore. Maybe that's healthy, maybe it isn't. I don't know, but uh, every case is individual and different. But, but why do you think, I mean, it goes back to the whole concept of celebrity and why people are obsessed with it. Alison Jackson, who's a, a great friend and also a, a wonderful artist who will depict things in photographs using lookalikes with situations that we imagine may have happened behind closed doors. But she always raises that question about our obsession with celebrity. Why are we obsessed? I think it's a myth. I think that there's a perception that people who have achieved fame for whatever they have done it with, whether it be music, um, theater, film, however they've made their name and their fortune. There's a fascination with those people. Why are they different from me? What is it they've got? Are they human? Do they walk on water? Is, uh, what, what exactly makes us different from them? People are always fascinated by people who've reached the top of their tree in whatever their pursuit. Of course, those people are generally more damaged, more dysfunctional, uh, more abused, they have a greater void to fill than your average person on the street. And their dilemma, their paradox, if you like, is that the more they try to fill their void, the less full it is. So they are chained to that dilemma. And that is what makes them keep striving to achieve. It, it, it's a thing that, uh, especially back, going back a few years, artists like the Beatles, especially the Beatles, people would listen to their songs and they think, oh, they have all the answers. They're, they're writing about me. They know my dilemma. They're, they're not realizing that these are universal sentiments sort of packaged almost in advertising slogans. And that in writing those songs, Paul McCartney, John Lennon would be trying to fill their own void, answer their own questions, sort out their own dilemmas. 
And people would take that as being that they had all the answers because they're able to write songs like this. But the reason they write the songs is to try and answer their own questions, which they don't have the answers to. And so the paradox goes on. And so the consumers of the product believe that they're buying the answers. The creators of the product are trying to find the answers. And that is never solvable. And I think it's, it's a little bit like the old fairy story, the emperor's new clothes, you know, the Hans Christian Andersen thing. And it took a little boy to, to poke his head up from the crowd and say, well, actually he's naked, he's got nothing on. It shows that it's all an illusion, but everybody is buying into the illusion. The artist is buying into it and the consumer, the fan is buying into it too. And actually there isn't an answer. There are no answers. Yeah. We're born, we live, we die. And we die not having the answers. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we, we subscribe to the artistic pursuits of certain very talented individuals because we like to kid ourselves that they have the answers. And there aren't any. I know, I, there you go. There's, there's the universal truth on, on the deathbed. There are no answers. But there, there is also that sort of pattern, isn't there? If you're ever talking about patterns for celebrity and what makes a celebrity tick, there is an incredible and surprising for a lot of people insecurity, isn't there? But that, yes, which is what I mean by dysfunction and uh, and disability to some extent and, and abuse. But you, you don't have to dig very deeply into the backstory of any artist to find those missing pieces, to find what drove them to try and create things in the first place, because they are it's a substitute for what's missing. And the more successful they become, the more insecure they become. One thing they can never solve is that they won't be immortal. The, the monster that they make, which is their art, that can be immortal in cases such as the Beatles. That music will go on forever, I believe. But they're not. They're only mortals and they will die like the rest of us. So in the end, we are all equal because we all face the same fate. And I think that's right. And we also have lots of challenges. I mean, we talk about, uh, well, tell me, for example, John Hurt tried to buy your baby once. <laughs> Poor old John. God rest his soul. Yeah. That was another thing that happened down at uh, the Entwistle's house, actually. That was where I met John. He was a, a great friend of John Entwistle's. And he and his wife, Donna, his wife at the time, hadn't been able to conceive. And they'd been going through IVF. And that is a very tough road for couples to attempt to negotiate. Um, it quite often ends in tears. It hadn't worked for them. And here I was, a young um, journalist doing quite well, but my relationship had fallen apart and I decided to continue with the pregnancy and to have my baby alone. And he thought this was a perfect solution and that money was the answer to everything. And that I would accept a chunk of his fortune in return for my child, which he and his wife could then bring up, not understanding that not everything has a price. And certainly my child didn't have a price. We don't buy babies in this country, do we? So it didn't happen, but John was blessed uh, a little bit later on, wasn't he? Yeah, he did. He and Donna sadly separated and he did marry again. And yes, his children did come along, but it was an unhappy ending for Donna. And I always felt sorry for her about that. And as you say, it's devastating, but it's sort of touching. Mm. You've also been propositioned in your time. By, oh, uh, a few times, yeah. Yeah, a few times. Tell me about some of those. No. <laughs> I think you, well, you talk about some of those in the book. You talk about Marco Pierre White. You talk about Bridget Bardot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Marco, he's a bad boy, isn't he, really? Um, I had to work in his kitchen once for a feature for You magazine. And he had a restaurant in those days called Harvey's in Wandsworth, he had Michelin stars there and everything, maybe even three. And um, when they decided they wanted to do this feature, send a journalist along to work in his kitchen, be abused by him because he's very abusive in the kitchen and, and write about it. So I was assigned to the story. Before he would accept for me to work in his kitchen, he had to interview me to see whether he wanted me in his kitchen. So my little girl, Mia, was, uh, she's probably about three by this time. She was at nursery. So I picked her up locally. I lived quite locally to this restaurant. Picked her up from nursery and walked around to the restaurant to meet him after the lunchtime shift. 
and uh, I think Jean Christophe was his maitre d' and I, he he let me in and I had to sit with Mia in the foyer waiting for Marco. Marco took about 40 minutes to appear and I suppose he was doing that classic thing of watching me from somewhere to just to kind of get a feel for for who I was and he he appeared eventually and asked Mia if she'd like a drink and she said she'd have water please and he's clapped to John Christophe to go and get the glass and he came back with a two litre bottle of water and Marco took the bottle and he said to Mia this tiny tiny little girl looked like a little fairy wouldn't say boo he said say when and she just looked at him this sort of Leonin beast with all this sort of Medusa hair and huge he's a very big man Marco and he, he's towering over her and he's pouring this water into glass and she didn't say when because she didn't say anything she was just completely gobsmacked by him and he carried on pouring the water the whole two litre bottle so it went all over her and into her little new leather sandals and and just everywhere and she just stood there and I just sat there and people said to me subsequently why didn't you say anything why didn't you get up and smack him around the face and say you bastard get off my child and whatever else because I was afraid of losing the commission I was afraid of the story not going ahead and upsetting the editor and all of those things you know I was I was there for for a job of work didn't say anything didn't react but he was horrible. And then we walked across to the ponds afterwards to feed the ducks. He had a bag of crumbs, gave to me and she went to feed the ducks. And um, he did actually say, um, you know, we're going to, don't you? And I said, sorry, uh, no. Um, but it was just, it was delivered to me as an assumption that um, that something would happen between us. And nothing could have been further from my mind at that point and subsequently I did work in his kitchen he was pretty horrible to me um he called me ugly ugly was my nickname in the kitchen so it would be oi ugly this oi ugly that get me my king cling film and and, and he was really rather unpleasant to everybody I think he wouldn't get away with that now I think there are probably different ways of running a kitchen nowadays but he was known for being mercurial and was almost praised for it in those days, in the early 90s. But I think that it would be classed as abuse nowadays and that you wouldn't be able to treat your staff like that anymore. I'm sure he's a much nicer person nowadays. Well, I, but, but also there's certain people that they will play up to a, a certain image. He was one of the first celebrities, if not the first celebrity chef. He uh, spawned the whole sort of generation, famous people through through his kitchen, obviously. Um, but if you can tell by your body language, it still affects you to this day, doesn't it? It's, it was surprising. It wasn't um, what I was expecting. I wasn't prepared for it. But I had to rise to the challenge. It was a damn good piece that I wrote. I remember it was a... The, the, the picture of Marco <laughs> was a double page spread picture. It was a profile picture and he was in, in close up, pouring over a big cauldron of whatever it was he was cooking. And there was a massive glob of sweat sort of hanging off the end of his nose. And the headline was Pierre White, the hottest chef in town, which I thought was so clever. Uh, not mine, of course, but yeah, it was it was. Yeah, well, I was pleased you. with the outcome. I, I say never, never let the truth stand in the way of a great story. <laughs> oh, we often do, though, don't we? I know, it's, it's always a thrill. Well, Bridget Bardot, tell me about her then, because um, uh, obviously there were sort of rumours about that sort of stuff. Um, proposition by her as well, weren't you? No, not really. Um, no, there were... People were cheeky at that time. You know, people got away with things in those days that they wouldn't necessarily dream of saying today uh so no we won't go there but, but, but again in the book though, about one of the reasons <clears> she was <throat> naked and things like that what, what was that reason well i think you're thinking of raquel welsh actually. oh raquel I, welsh i'm sorry of bridget bardo <laughs> raquel welsh well, well tell me about raquel welsh then go for it no raquel welsh i met through um a chap who was managing her at the time and uh <coughs> Excuse me, I'm running out of steam here. We've been talking for so long. Um, I, uh, I stayed with her in her place in Los Angeles for a while. And um, I 
because I moved to LA and I, I was living in the Sunset Marquee and I had to find somewhere to live. And, and our mutual friend said, well, you know, Raquel could use a housemate for a while. She's pretty lonely by herself. Why don't you move in with her? Well, you know, you don't think these things through when you're younger and you let yourself in for things. She, um, I had a role to fulfill. She called me um, Baby, that was my nickname. And I had to call her Rocky. And she always talked about herself in the third person. So she'd say, come on, you know, come on, baby. I tell Rocky she looks good today because the girl's got to know. And, and she was very insecure. And there were huge blown up photographs of her all over the house, sort of in, in various states of undress. So these were her security blankets. She, she had to sort of maintain her youthful appearance. And she was quite obsessed with all that. And um, yeah, we were, we were pretty close friends for a while. And I, only afterwards did I question the validity of that friendship because it was a very unequal friendship. She was a Hollywood star. I was just a, a little minion journalist from London making my way. And she was quite a lot older than me and had had a different life path. And really she needed me around to make her feel good. And so you have, you know, throughout your life, you have those very intense friendships that flare and burn out very quickly. And after I came back to London, I never heard from her again. It's, um, she moved on and she found somebody else to fulfill that role. So for those friendships are never true and especially not in Tinseltown where everybody is faking it to make it. Everybody is pretending to be other than they are. Even the guy who parks your car at the Beverly Hills Hotel, he's dying to show you his script, you know, and can you get him in to see the director and, and whatever else. Even the cop who stops you for a traffic offence is, is writing a miniseries. You know, everybody is in that town for the same reason. And it eats them up and spits them out. And it's the kind of place where you can stay too long. You don't live in Los Angeles permanently. You get in, you do what you get there to do, and you get out. And New York has gone that way as well, I think. Yeah, I think in the, whole, recent years. the whole profession, and again, that's a sort of pattern about insecurity and things like that. But but she spoke to you about, uh, as I think you asked her, didn't you, about uh, uh, why she never um, uh, accepted invitations to appear uh, nude. Oh, it was to do with her Latin nipples, baby, um, which um, she had to show me just to make sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it was, my mother didn't bring me up to uh, look at things like that. I was... I turned the other cheek. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, all interesting stories, as you say, um, uh, and so many different names sort of punctuate uh, your life story and who became friends. Um, but John Lennon and uh, the latest book with a glorious, uh, enticing title, because everybody thinks they know the answer about who killed John Lennon. Tell me why you felt it was necessary to write another book about John Lennon. Well, um, there were two big anniversaries coming up. So, so uh, it was about to be, believe it or not, 40 years since he'd been assassinated. And had he lived, he would have turned 80 last year. So that number resonated, the 40, 80. It just felt like time to revisit his story and to do so from a woman's point of view. All the books written about John were written by male music writers who have an agenda, which is pretty similar across the board. They approach it through the music and it's quite worthy and they don't go very much into the emotions of the subject. And I wanted to revisit John's life and to really go into his psyche through the women in his life, because you get a different angle, a different, a different side to the story, a different John. And I started to discover that there were various Johns and that he'd abandoned himself at stages along the way and he'd reinvented himself and the evolution was quite dramatic. So my question to myself at that point was who was the original John Lennon in, in that case? And when did that original John Lennon die and why? Who or what killed him? So that was my quest, was to answer my question. And, and the answer to that question, I mean, you, you dealt, touch on it beforehand about uh, always looking for a, a mother figure, if you like, and his sort of the true love of his life. What, what do you think uh, that was the real John Lennon? Do you think we ever really saw him? Well, he's in my book and uh, I'd love people to go there and read and work their way back through the various Johns and, and to read it as I found it out, which is how I, 
I attempted to write it. Um, it's a voyage of discovery. Yeah, he was there. His dysfunction, and of course it always goes back to that, began when his mother gave him away, when he was a very little boy, to her elder sister, his auntie Mimi, who brought him up, but not kindly and not gently and not the way a mother would have done. She was quite a remote um, maternal figure, but he would go to her for a cuddle sometimes and she would say, oh, you have a you have a real mother for all that kind of thing. But of course, he wasn't in touch with his real mother for some years and then discovered that actually she was only living just over a mile away and he could have had a relationship with her all that time. So he re resumed that and he did start to go around to her house. She really helped to foster his, his, his obsession with music. She had a banjo, she taught him chords, she had a gramophone and a record collection. And Mimi had none of that at home and wasn't really interested in John practicing music. She would make him do it in the front porch or in the garden, he couldn't do it in the house. Uh, Julia was a different kind of person and, and John was much more like his biological mother than anybody else. So that was a real tragedy that he was separated from her. And then not very long after they were back having a relationship as, as mother and son, she was killed outside his house by an off-duty policeman, knocked down by a car. And John thereafter had to get up every morning and draw the curtains on the spot in the road where his mother had died. And that must have had a profound psychological effect on him. And I felt that it was a theme running through his songwriting. You didn't have to look very far to always feel that John was seeking his mother in some way. And some of his most moving works, such as Julia, which was his mother's name, and that is it's a very moving song. Uh, Mother, which is a heart-rending song to listen to. And um, even in Woman, which we tend to think is about Yoko Ono and him having found his spiritual, his soulmate. Um, there are even shades of Julia in that song as well. But of course, Yoko was his ultimate mother figure. She was the mother replacement therapy. And being that much older than him, about eight years, uh, he called her mother. He would address her as mother, the way northern men tended to address the woman of the house in those days. But it wasn't just that. There was much more to that. Yoko was John's linchpin and she was the maternal figure in their household. And he cleaved to her. He was nothing without her. She made him a decent human being and she took the rap for it. People hated her. She was subjected to terrible racist abuse and run out of town, people said. You know, they went to America to escape all the furore, but did they? There were other reasons why they went to America. And uh, I believe that John was in a really good place when he died. He had the woman of his dreams, his relationship was repaired. They had a little boy together and he was making music again. Life was very good and positive. And so he left the planet at a very young age. But I think, if it's possible to find the answers, John had found his. And that's hinted at in the song from Double Fantasy, the last album of his lifetime, which he made with Yoko. The song Watching the Wheels with the famous line, I just had to let it go. Meaning all that stuff from before, the Beatles, all the, the madness of those years on the road and not being listened to, being screamed at and, and all the things that happened subsequently. He'd simplified his life right down to the very meaningful things, which were someone to love, a child to raise together, and a creative pursuit, and happiness. So we can console ourselves with the fact that John was in a really good place when he died. And, and it is a really sort of positive, it's, it's a brilliant book, brilliant. Thank book. you. Thank you. Everybody. Another brilliant book in your wonderful series as well. Um, Thank you. For Yoko, though, and another sort of mother, mother figure who was taken uh, far too early was, was Alma. Um, talk about Alma Cogan. Alma Cogan was the first female pop star in the UK. She was known as the girl with the giggle in her voice, the girl with a laugh in her voice. She wore the wondrous big sticky out net frocks and her, she was very coquettish and she had TV show. She was hugely popular. They met at the London Palladium and uh, George Harrison said John was mad about her. He absolutely worshipped Alma. The, the strange bit was that Cynthia, his first wife, John's first wife, said 
that John used to take the mickey out of her and he would do an impersonation, a wicked impersonation of Alma singing these very sort of saccharine songs. But then he met her again. She was an older woman. They engaged in an affair, uh, which a lot of people have denied. But other people like Alma's sister have said, well, yes, it definitely happened. Um, and that they would check into hotels as, as Mr. and Mrs. Winston, which was John's middle name, of course. Um, but then Alma contracted ovarian cancer and she died at 36 and John was devastated. And almost on the rebound from that, he turned around and met Yoko and... 34, 34 in... Um, was she 34? I thought, did I say 36? Yeah, but that's, she, she died in 66, which right, sort of throws it off. And she was uh, born yeah. in 1932. But yes, anyway, she was... 30 years. something. She was young anyway to die of, of ovarian cancer. And um, on the rebound, pretty much, John turned around and became involved with Yoko. Who well, again, also was that much older than him? Yeah, I see again, sort of same thing, wasn't it? She was eight years older, and, and yeah. you have a look, it is that mother figure. And, and you look at some of the photos, and, and you've got some great photos in, in this book as well. Mm -hmm. But you look at some of the photos of John's mother, and you look at Alma, and they're not too dissimilar, are they? Mm. There is a look, I, certainly, there was a look about women in the 50s, and I think it's, it was because they all had. Uh, the perm and the dark lipstick and the powdered nose and all of that. There was a, there was a definite sort of look about women in that era. Um, a woman to look up to, a woman to be mothered by, which is what all men want, isn't it, Andrew? Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Quality. I mean, we all want to be loved. Everybody wants to be loved, which which I think is absolutely right. Three final things, and I'll let you go, because it's been an absolute delight uh, catching up with you. What, what has been your proudest moment? Giving birth to my children. Best productions ever. It's always good. <laughs> Even the ones you put in Pampers adverts. Yeah, they're never disappointing. They're never boring. I had dinner with my son last night, just the two of us, and he took me to a bar afterwards, and it was obviously a bar that he goes to quite often because he knew all the staff and he went in there and he was actually <laughs> parading me around saying oh this is my mom and you know this is my mom and, and I, I thought this is really sweet actually that he actually wants to bring me out and introduce me to his friends yeah they they never disappoint they're they're, they're wondrous people and we get to live life all over again through our kids don't we yeah. oh, I'm not in any rush for grandchildren by the way oh, okay. <laughs> like that can take its time yeah, and, and your, your biggest regret? Oh, the things I didn't say to my dad. And I spent a lot of times with my father, um, endless time. He, he, he was my, my biggest champion and the greatest help to me. And if I could, if I could write one tenth as well as he did and have that cutting insight into the human condition and to be able to explain things so succinctly. He could do in 800 words in a column in The Independent what it takes me 140,000 words to do in a book. And I'm still learning. Um, I had so much more to learn from him and he was taken from us. So, so yeah, I think about him a lot. And I often ask myself the question, what would dad have done? What would dad have said? How would he have handled this? And it uh, keeps me on the straight and narrow most of the time. Most of the time on the straight and narrow. Well, finally then, finally after this mammoth episode. This should be a series. I love it. It's kind of <laughs> yeah, let's do it again. Let's do it again. But finally, let's have I press the record button. Um, but finally. <laughs> oh, dear. Finally, Leslie Ann Jones, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, gosh. How would I like to be remembered? Um... Oh, for buying a round in the Groucho Club and uh, for always being up for it, I suppose. Uh, yeah, just for, be, for, for having been a, a good mom and a good friend and, um, and having been there for people. It's, you become friends with the people you write books about as well. And for that reason, I turn down a lot of books that come my way because you've got to really be into someone to spend such a huge chunk of your life with that person. You've got to respect their art and what they did with their life and be interested in finding out more about them and to, and to condense them into a digestible form for the reader, for, for other people who also have huge respect for that person as well. 
So it's just, it's about respecting the subjects and the material, really. If 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 I'm known for anything, it would be nice to be known for that. Well, it's a lovely thing to be known for. I won't press you on the names you've turned down because I know you won't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I buy you a drink, we'll... Um... We'll, we'll see you next time. Now that Grouch, you're yeah. back, I, I look forward to that moment. Uh, for Definitely. Now, Leslie Ann Jones, thank you very much for being my guest. Thank you. So thank you again to the wonderful Leslie Ann Jones. Get yourself a copy of this fantastic book, a masterful work, groundbreaking in its revelations. If you thought there could not be another book on Jen Lennon, you were wrong. This is absolutely brilliant. It was a delight to catch up with Leslie Ann Jones. If you'd like more of the same, more great interviews, more great chats, you can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV. Don't forget to subscribe to The Andrew Eborn Show on all of the usual platforms. And do join me next time for more great guests, more great revelations. Uh, but until then, thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.